Coming up next is another highlight of this virtual Heidelberg Laureate Forum. The two Turing laureates, Donald Knut and Robert Hajan, will discuss topics based on questions previously submitted by the young researchers. Donald Knut received the 1974 ACM AM Turing Award for his major contribution to the analysis of algorithm and the design of programming languages, and in particular for his contribution to the art of computer programming through his well-known book series. Robert Rajan was awarded the 1983 Nevanlina Prize and the 1986 ACM AM Turing Award, along with John Hopcroft, for fundamental achievements in the design and analysis of algorithm and data structures. Bob and Don, take it away. Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, let me just welcome everybody who's online, all the young researchers and everyone uh, uh, participating. Um, you know, both of us are getting kind of long in the tooth now, but Don, you've always been one of my personal heroes. So it's a bit intimidating to engage with you in this. And it's a great honor and a great pleasure for me to have this opportunity to converse with you. You know, you've been a, an idol of mine ever since I got to uh, Stanford as a first year grad student. I think what we'll try to do here is uh, maybe I'll ask Don several questions and then he can answer, ask me several questions and we'll try to get an interesting dialogue going. I have lots of questions from the young researchers. I apologize in advance that we probably won't be able to get to all your questions. So many questions, so little time, but let's get started here. Um, Don, my first question to you is, can you tell us about your t-shirt? Uh, how clever of you to ask that question. <laughs> so, okay, I don't know if you can see it very well, but it says concrete mathematics. This is, this is a special t-shirt. Uh, I don't know, maybe only two or three were ever made. It, it's, it, it, it came out in 1989 when, when, the, when our book Concrete Math was new, and I'm wearing it uh, in honor of Ron Graham, my, uh, my co-author who died in July. And, and it was his daughter, Cheryl, who made these t-shirts for us at that time. <clears throat> it, it was a terrible loss to the field, his passing. Um, and, and, can you tell us? You mentioned Princeton, you know, and, and, uh, and of course he was using the text at Princeton that year, and I was using it at Stanford. <clears throat> That was a beautiful book, Concrete Mathematics. I actually had to teach an undergraduate course out of it. And I have to say, um, it was a challenge because it's beautiful, but there's lots of advanced material in it. Yeah, we never could figure out what was difficult about it, but, but we knew that it was something. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, my second question, um, can you tell us a little bit about your personal journey and how you got into computer science? And maybe why computer science, not mathematics, given that I first knew you as a professor of mathematics at Caltech? Oh, yeah, well, that's true. Uh, uh, when I got started, of course, there was no such thing as computer science. Uh, and, and computer science, uh, I think the first computer science department uh, came out about 1965. Stanford was one of the very first, uh, and, and so you know I, I got my. I started in college in 1956. That's nine years before the computer science existed, um, um, and uh, I started out majoring in physics. And then uh, I found out that the labs were too hard for me. I couldn't. I I couldn't do welding, for example. Uh, uh, it was it was terrible. Uh, all that voltage, and I and, and and I had to. Well, I don't want to go into a long story, but it, but it scared me that I couldn't see what I was doing, and I and and, and I uh, and I couldn't do the lab. So, uh, sophomore year, I um, I took a, a math class that, uh, um, that that convinced me that I should really switch over. And uh, so I became a math major, and there were five of us at at at, at Case at the time, and so I I got my 
my bachelor's um, in math at 1960. Then I then I went to Caltech, and uh, and studied uh, uh, mostly combinatorial mathematics uh, with Marshall Hall. Uh, so, uh, and for some reason Caltech uh, decided to keep me on as a professor, so I stayed it. So so I I I, I had a great uh, I had a great uh, I had a great time at Caltech, um, and including meeting, I, I don't know, maybe you were a freshman by the time I left. I, my last year was 60, I, I mean, the, the, the summer of 68 is when, I, is when I took a year off to work uh, on national service. But, the, uh, um, but anyway, uh, I, uh, by that time, I realized that, you know, that computer science was really my, uh, uh, my, my career path because, uh, because I had seen that, uh, uh, well, I, I was editing several journals at the time for, uh, from the math department at Caltech, and I, but I was sitting in lots and lots of lectures uh, uh, about mathematics where I was sitting in the back row saying, so what, so what? Uh, and but 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 the lectures that I was hearing and this, and all the correspondence I was having about about uh, computer science uh, was uh, was very exciting for me. So so I uh, I I decided uh, that probably I should make one move in my life, uh, namely to uh, I, you know to be a, a full professor somewhere. And and I had uh, there were four major places I, I was deciding between. One was. Uh, one was Stanford, uh, one was Berkeley, and one was Harvard, all in computer science, and and the fourth was Caltech, where I would stay in mathematics. Um, and uh, so anyway, I, I came to Stanford, and and then shortly after you came as at, uh, as a first year student, and one of the reasons I went to Stanford was I thought you know at Caltech we couldn't really. Re re uh, redo re much in computer science and I and you came to my office and I you know and, and I was your advisor for classes and you know and I and, and I think okay Stanford's got this great curriculum so I listed all the courses that we have and you and you said oh you, you've already taken those courses from some visitor who came to Caltech so, so, uh, so anyway that's how I got into into the field and and, and basically I I believe it's because uh, because I realized even when I was an undergraduate that uh, uh, that there was something about the, the way my brain had had um, uh, evolved that by that time that uh, 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 computers w were really resonating with me and I and I really loved uh, uh, everything uh, uh, all these connections I, I just I, I was born to be a geek. <laughs> or maybe at least by the time I was, I was sixteen. I was. <laughs> so uh, uh, I have several questions, but I'll re I'll just ask one now and then turn it over to you. When did the idea for the book come to you? When did you get started on that project? Yeah, they are, yeah I was I was a, a second year grad student at Caltech, and it was January nineteen sixty two. So I, you know, I'd entered and in the fall of 1960. And, and uh, uh, my favorite textbooks uh, had been published by Addison Wesley, uh, an undergraduate, my, my calculus book, my physics book, and, you know, my, some book on number theory and various things that I think that I liked a lot. Um, and uh, an editor from Addison Wesley took me out to lunch and said, Don, we'd like you to write a book about how to write a compiler. And and well, uh, and gosh, I I had always I had enjoyed writing. I had been working uh, for uh, campus publications, for example, and so I uh, and so I was thrilled by this idea. And I came home and and I on a sheet of yellow paper that I still have somewhere, I wrote down the title of twelve chapters that I thought ought to be in this book. Uh, chapter twelve was about compilers, and the other eleven chapters were preparing. <laughs> For compilers, and and I'm so far I'm up to chapter seven now, uh, uh, from that list that I started in 1962. 
Well, I'm sure we'll return to the topic of the book, but maybe now I'll turn it over to you and let you ask a few questions. Yeah, okay. Well, so how did you, I mean, did you learn that you were a geek at the time? How, how, how did you get in, uh, get, get the bug to come? I'll, I'll, I'll go back a little farther in my personal history. Um, way back. My father was a, uh, uh, he ran a state mental hospital in California, and um, he was interested in doing research on uh, reasons for de developmental disablement. And um, he, uh, he was fairly well known. Linus Pauling, who was at Caltech at the time, uh, came over to our house and they were doing a joint research project. And uh, Dr. Pauling left the Caltech catalog with me, so I had that scientific in interest. When I got into public school, this was back in the days when the California public schools were still uh, really strong. I had an amazing math teacher, so I got the bug to study mathematics. I read Scientific American columns by Martin Gardner. I had an opportunity when I was in high school to do a little bit of programming and I worked uh, when I was in college uh, doing computer programming. So uh, my plan was always to do mathematics. I went to Caltech as an undergraduate. Unfortunately, I never got a chance to take a class from you. Uh, Caltech at the time was all about physics. The math department was a little bit strange, but wonderful. Uh, brilliant combinatorials, Herb Reiser, uh, Marshall Hall. So I had a uh, I had a great time, although I have to say being an undergraduate at Caltech was probably the biggest, one of the biggest challenges of my life. It was extremely intense. Then deciding on graduate school, uh, I applied to a couple of math departments and a couple of computer science departments and ended up going to Stanford and in computer science and never regretting it because it gave me an opportunity to use mathematics in something where you could actually see in a concrete way the effects, algorithms and algorithm analysis and so on. So that's, that's a short version of the story. Good, and, and, and uh, we're lucky that uh, John Hopcock had a sabbatical so he came to visit. Uh, that was an extremely fortunate event. Yes, that is certainly true. And it was early days. I mean, Alan Kay, uh, Stanford in those days was a very special place. Uh, Alan Kay gave a talk already in the HLF and he said something like, find a great research community. Stanford in those days in computer science was a great research community. And of course there was involvement of people from Berkeley too. Um, Dick Carp and Gene Waller and grad students, and it was quite an amazing place. Well, we have to rem remind the people that those were, it, it, although it was 1970, it was really the 60s. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, 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 I mean, as I recall, you lived in Berkeley in the commune, and, and, and you commuted every day. Uh, and and as, as I, I sort of remember that you were, that I was very worried about you because you were proving theorems in your head as you were driving the freeways and I was afraid you'd get into a wreck. The, <laughs> thank you for that concern. That was when I got to be an assistant professor at uh, Stanford. Oh, that was after my grad student days. Oh, oh, yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Well, I got I get the time mixed up in there. It's been a few years ago, but um, so um, but anyway, it, it was uh, there. There was a lot going on in those days outside of <laughs> outside of college as well, uh, and I, I guess there, there always is. But but those days were pretty. <laughs> I, I mean, the, the, you know, uh, students were setting fire to campus buildings. <laughs> It was the height of the Vietnam War and protests against the war, and there was the whole hippie movement, and uh, it was a very interesting time. Many of us were very idealistic, somehow perhaps a little naive or a little too idealistic. Well, 
Well, thank goodness people are idealistic and naive, I, I, I see. So, uh, uh, now, uh, the, the thing I remember most is that basically in the 70s, I, I, you revolutionized computer science, <laughs> in, 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 at least uh, from my standpoint, which is, which is uh, uh, you know, writing, trying to write a textbook. Uh, uh, you and, uh, and Arnold Schoenhardt in the 70s were the two people who most upset uh, my table of contents uh, for, 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 <laughs> for what I would have to do. And, and the reason was that um, uh, it, it, it was, you know, you were doing things that I had absolutely no conception of in 1962 when I set up this uh, other plan for the books. And, and, it, and, it, and especially this was the first time, I mean, it, 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 this now seems uh, maybe uh, it was obvious, but, but boy, it was so, it, it was so unusual to uh, to, uh, to, to find something like a deep algorithm, so, so something that so, some some property of, of of a brand new way to organize information in in computer that that uh, that what that that uh, uh, I don't know it's it's way out there. It, it, everything hung together. Uh, I, I, I'm blown away by. But by the fact that somebody could actually prove theorems about uh, complicated uh, data structures, and 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 before that, there there were just data structures you could easily explain to somebody in ten minutes or maybe in a half an hour. But 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 all of a sudden you come up with this uh, with these methods that uh, are, are that really take a lot of proof and and and, and almost amazing that they work at all. Um, so, so uh, I remember my secretary Phyllis said that you would visit her every once in a while, and you would. Uh, I mean, not, so you were also doing research while you were sitting in her in, in her house, I guess. Um, uh, also th thinking about these things, but 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 I mean, can you say something about the origin of those ideas uh, uh, that you would even conceive of having? A deep data structure. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> that's a hard question to answer. How does one figure out how to do research? One tries, one has to be intensely curious. One has to explore the design space. And the thing is, computers kept getting faster and faster. Moore's law was a gift to theoreticians as, a well, as well as to practitioners, it creates the opportunity to think about things on a higher level. And uh, the idea of um, analyzing algorithms from a bit of a fuzzy point of view that is ignoring constant factors really opened up the, the field. I'm thinking about actually proving time bounds, which really wasn't done until we started doing it. I think that was that was important because it kind of drove, if you have a goal to make an algorithm faster, then you're forced to strip away the irrelevance and figure out what the critical parts are that are involved in the computation and use those in exactly the right way. So, uh, so, so was your initial work? Uh, because of this goal that you had about you know trying to get linear time, or were you were, were you trying to you know just get cubic time or something? I mean, what, I, I'm I'm thinking what was the, was the linear time challenge the thing that that did it first for you? Or, or, uh, well, how did I come to start really working hard on algorithms? I took a Lisp programming course from John McCarthy, who was another Turing Award winner. Who, unfortunately. <laughs> And again, great Stanford environment. Uh, but his final project, we were supposed to write a LISP program. One of the options was to write a LISP program to uh, test graphs for planarity. I had been interested in planar graphs because I was interested in the four color, the now theorem problem. I was trying to prove this myself in high school using computational methods, but 
I didn't have enough information and enough computational power. Hawken and Appel solved this problem in 1976, I guess, using exactly these techniques. So, uh, and um, the, the mathematical criterion for planarity is the famous Kuratowski criterion. A graph is non-planar if it contains a complete graph on five vertices or a complete bipartite graph on two sets of three vertices. So everybody else tried to implement the Kuratowski test. Well, I managed to find a paper by Shimon Evan and uh, Wempel, Evan, and Cedarbaum, actually, which gave a algorithm which essentially constructed an abstract representation of embedding. So I implemented that algorithm. Turns out to be quadratic time. They didn't state that, but that's what yeah. it is. And, and I managed to do really well on the project. So then I thought, if quadratic time, why not faster? And John Hopcroft came and we started talking about graph algorithms and exploring the potentials of depth for search and, um, uh, and things led to things. When you have a tool that works effectively, you try it on any problem you can think of. So let me, let me turn it back to, oh, go ahead. I was gonna turn it back to you, uh, back to Case Western. Um, I seem to remember a famous story about you being on the basketball team. Can you say something about that? Uh, well, I was the manager. I was a scorekeeper, and uh, and if somebody wants to look this up, there's a there's a one minute video. So just just Google for YouTube for it's called the Electronic Coach, and and I worked out a a, a way to. Uh, 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 to to keep the basketball statistics more than had been done before, and and uh, and I came up with a formula for each player as to how as to how much they contributed to that game that, that took into account the, the the shots they missed and the and the and fumbles and 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 the, and the rebounds that they got and things like this all, all into one. Whereas formula, I don't believe the formula anymore, but at least I had this formula, and and uh, and so it wasn't just the the, the points that you that you scored, but everything that you did uh, went into this, and and uh, I, I I I would punch cards after every game and, and and compute these numbers, and then the coach seemed to like them. That was that was back in the day when we were programming on IBM machines, and you had to input things on punch cards on in great massive boxes of punch cards, and yep, uh, and you can see it in yes. that video, and. Uh, and also, I, I wrote a book. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm glad that I lived long enough to write this book. It's called "Selected Papers on Fun and Games," and and one of the chapters in there gives the whole story about this, including the reviews in the newspapers and uh, how it was carried on Waller Cronk like show and everything like the Newsweek magazine. <laughs> so it seems like you were doing quantitative sports analysis 30 years ahead of its time. Did, did you have an, ever an, an opportunity or interaction with some of these people who are doing it now for real with professional oh, oh, no, sports no, no. teams? No, no, it, it, that was when it was easy and fun. And, and fun. But I, you know, I, I, you know, I was a junior. Um, so, so the, uh, but, but anyway, that's one of the... The, I, I mean, it, it just shows again uh, that, that that how computers were totally involved, uh, you know, with my life all the way through. Um, so, computer science. It's been said that any field that has science in its name is not a science. So I might ask you. Is computer science a science, a branch of engineering, a branch of mathematics, an art? But let me ask it in a more personal way, especially since you titled your famous books, The Art of Computer Programming. Do you see yourself as an artist, a scientist, a mathematician, an engineer, a philosopher, some combination? Yeah, okay. So I actually that was the that was the subject of my Turing talk in 1974. So uh, uh, I, I can't, I can't, I can't do any better than ask people to look back that. But but any but to, uh, to shorten it. Uh, 
I, I, I looked up about art and science uh, and, I, and I found, uh, you know, lots and lots of books that had this, these in the, in the title. And, uh, and there were, uh, and, and, you know, like I quote a whole bunch of them in that at the time. And, uh, and I realized that, that the word art um, uh, stands for uh, um, not only fine arts, but also things like, like things that are artificial and things that, and basically it comes from the Greek word techne, in German Kunst and so on. Uh, uh, it means uh, something that's made by, by, by human beings um, uh, as opposed to being present in nature. Uh, and science is, is, is the study of knowledge and, and organization of things. And so, uh, so, so in a sense, uh, I came to a short definition that says science is, is uh, what we understand well enough to explain to a computer and art is everything else. And, and as science advances, we learn more and more about our, uh, whatever field we're studying. Um, but then as we learn more and more about it, our brains figure out and, and, and keep a few jumps ahead and that's the art. So that, that raises a very interesting question because um, uh, artificial intelligence has been reborn now as deep learning neural nets and some people are worried that the, the singularity is coming where computers will uh, evolve beyond us in intelligence. What role do humans have in this? Should we be worried about this? What do you think of this? new version of artificial intelligence. Yeah, well, I don't know how long it'll be before they rename our department the Department of Machine Learning, but, uh, but uh, uh, it, 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 I, I'm, uh, I, yeah, I'd rather talk about almost anything else, but, but I'm seriously worried about the uh, potential for, for weapons, especially, and, and uh, uh, this video that, um, that, uh, gosh, what's the name of it? Any, anyway, uh, uh, I, I, it's such an important video that, but I, but I put it out of my mind, I guess. <laughs> um, and, and, and so uh, uh, Steve, Steve, uh, uh, Steve Russell uh, uh, put out this, this important thing that showed that it's not that, that far out that we, that we could have little little drones for, you know targeting our enemies and and and, and nobody be able to do it to stop it and and that's that, and it, it doesn't wouldn't cost that much for for terrorists to do this uh, not to mention uh, people who don't like pe other people in in their own government or, or somebody others some other country so Boy, it seems like technology there is always, always uh, has good uses and bad uses, and it's up to us as human beings to use technology in the right ways. It's a big challenge. Yeah, yeah, we have to understand it. That's for sure. I, um... Well, do you think that we, as theoretical computer scientists or mathematicians, have something to contribute to uh, the new field of artificial intelligence? Should we? What's our role here. I know some of my colleagues have jumped in trying to uh, analyze. One big challenge seems to be neural nets solve problems, do things, accomplish tasks, but nobody, nobody has a clue as to how they do it. There's no explanation, which is kind yeah. of anti-scientific. Um, yeah, that's right. Is I, that I, 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 where... I, I apologize for saying Steve Russell and then Stuart Russell, of course, and 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 he's given the most uh, the most deep thought to this problem of how to how to prepare uh, early on for it. And uh, but 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 the unfortunate thing is that his solutions uh, always assume that human beings are rational, and and uh, I'm I'm I, I'm beginning to wonder 
more and more about that every day because people are not being rational. Uh, and, and that is, so we have to figure out a way to save the world uh, 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 with, with the irrationality. So but anyway, uh, as you say, uh, people like you and me are, uh, have things that we're good at and we aren't necessarily good at everything. And so uh, uh, I figured uh, I've got a few more years to live. I'm gonna spend my time about the things that I can do more uniquely than things that, I, that I'm not sure anybody can do. <clears throat> I, that, that's the conclusion I came to also. There's little time and let's use our abilities that we have in the best way we can. Um, this is perhaps a related question. Computer science, unlike mathematics, is still a very young field. I mean, you got into it at the very beginning and I was only more or less a decade later. Um, what does this mean? I mean, how do you see computer science going forward? How has it changed in your lifetime? Do you have directions you would like to see it go? Yeah, maybe. I, I, I... All these questions I had to turn back to you to see what your take on. But so, uh, uh, it, it's not clear whether computer science is a subset of mathematics or mathematics is a subset of computer science. And, and, and uh, on different days, I could argue either way. But but actually, I believe that they're they're different. And I can, and although I've been part of part of both worlds at different times, I. I consider myself a lapsed mathematician now. That, uh, it's, uh, you know, uh, but there are days when I'll when I say, "Oh, today I'm going to I'm going to think like a mathematician," and 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 sometimes I can solve a problem by by taking it uh, by by, by uh, you know having my uh, um, mathematician's cloak on and then uh, for a day and then I and I put on my computer scientist cap and I. And I work on it from another point of view, and I and and, and, so, and I, uh, but I can I can strongly feel a, feel a difference when I'm operating in one mode or the other. I argued this with Bill Thurston though, and he couldn't see any difference. So I don't know, you know, this might be just me. Uh, but 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 to me, I think that computer science and mathematics are the two uh, sciences known so far, you know, bodies of of, of knowledge known so far that are not based on nature. Uh, They're science, created by human beings. Yes. That's... We get to make up our own ground rules. You know, we design the universe that we're going to study. Um, and, and physicists don't have that, have that, uh, well, string theorists maybe, but, but uh, uh, you know, uh, chemists, biologists, they, they deal with, with nature, but mathematics, computer science, uh, are, are, are the parts where, where we're studying things that are uh, detached for, uh, but, 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 but created, uh, uh, this idea, uh, is, was it really out there all the time or not? But, 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 but anyway, that, make, that separates it from the other field. And I see that uh, um, uh, as years go by, um, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I think the, the math, mathematicians are starting to get it uh, the, the way I understand computer science and, and computer scientists are, are a lot of times uh, more interested in Wall Street than in, uh, uh, <laughs> than in, uh, than, than in, in, in scientific, uh, you, you know, as you know, a lot of our star students have, have, have gone off and become, uh, uh, hedge, hedge fund people or something instead of instead of advancing now, you know. So so I've never I, 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 when we were in the seventies and there was a question whether universities would survive and so on. It was clear to me that if you know if Stanford would would, would be burnt down, I would still uh, gather a bunch of students somewhere and we would go somewhere and we would and we would want to talk about computer science. Um, and I've never been, I, I, I've never said, oh, what's a good way to, 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 to have an easy life or, 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 you know, or, or to make a lot of money or something like this. Start a company, uh, uh, have all these stock options and then buy an island somewhere. This is you know, the last thing in my list of motivation. Um, 
on the other hand, I know a, a, a lot of people uh, did their best work because of the uh, because they were excited by by different things that that excite me. I'm not saying my way is the only way. I just uh, and, well, let and, me give it back. Let me give it back to you and give you the opportunity to ask me a few questions. Yes. Yeah, so, what do you think about this, the the motivation that that, that keeps you going? I, 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 like I think you're finishing a book now. <laughs> Starting a book. Well, the long delayed book project. I, I make no commitments, but uh, yeah, in this process, I discovered the beauty of tech. I have to say, I waited too long to try to learn this. We'll see how it goes. But you know, I, <laughs> I had the same feeling as you as I was developing these algorithms in the 70s and the 80s. The field is not yet stable enough to try to capture information in a book. But at this point now, finally, this is one of the positive things about what has happened with the, the epidemic, the pandemic. Uh -huh. uh, I've got a lot more time because I'm not in an airplane, so I actually started doing some writing, and it requires large blocks of time, obviously. And I think there's enough stability that it's actually maybe possible to, to do it. So let me, uh, isn't it true that you started writing a, a, a monograph and, and you left the whole manuscript in, the, in a metro station once and lost it? Is it uh, th there was a brief case that I left in a metro station in Paris, yes, containing mm -hmm. lots of useful stuff. I used to write on pencil and uh, paper. Um, now it's on the computer and, hope, and most of it's stored in the cloud, fortunately. So I guess I'm trusting to a particular platform as opposed to you who are trusting your local, uh, your local environment. I hope your house is secure. On because we wouldn't want to lose that treasure trove of information. Uh, well, I think it's okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I uh, w w w when you when you spoke about plans for our, our dialogue, you, uh, you mentioned that you had some concerns about publications and and, and conference uh, 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 culture and things like that. Uh, can you elaborate? Yes, yes, yes. This is a this is a difference, I think, between most scientific fields, and I would include mathematics there as well, and, and computer science as it has evolved. It seems now like we're putting all our effort into conference publications, fast turnaround. And if you're a mathematical field, maybe it works for the experimentalists, but for the theoreticians, it's kind of amazing to me. I'm sort of old, I mean, I'm sort of a lapsed mathematician in the same way that you are. It's kind of amazing to me that we make progress in spite of the fact that there are plenty of mistakes. There's plenty of kind of half-baked publications with great results, but not fully worked out. And it kind of breaks my heart that people don't take the time to go back and fill in the details and investigate uh, Further. So I, I don't, it, it seems to be an inevitable trend in our field and it's getting even a little bit worse with the advent of platforms such as Archive where people can post almost uh, anything semi-refereed at best. So uh, I, I am concerned about it. I, I think it's very important to try to get everything into a refereed journal if possible. I try to encourage my students to do that, but it is a challenge. It's gotten much more about publish and perish than it seems like it was back when I was a student. Yeah, well, I imagine that's because there are thousands of people now <laughs> when there were only dozens when you and I were young, but, but uh, boy, I, yeah, I, well, I know, I know enough about the history that there's always been problems with uh, quality control in publication. Um, but I, but I, I remember last year I got really angry when I, when I heard about, you know, I, I looked at a paper and I thought it was, you know, it solved a problem that I, that I thought I would never see the solution of in my lifetime. And I thought, and, and it was a brilliant, uh, you know, brilliant solution, but the problem involved 
generalization of Knight's tours, and the guy uh, got, got the, the most insulting referee reports when he submitted the article to a journal. Uh, and, I, and I showed this, you know, and, and essentially, you know, these 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 uh, high peer academics were saying no, nobody would ever stoop to write a paper about something that the generalization of a nice tour and so, and so on. Well, uh, the, the, uh, and, and so <clears throat> there's no there's no accounting for taste, and I can't say that my taste is better than others. And I. I can look at papers and I can say this is trash and I can look at something else and I say this is beautiful and I, and I have no algorithm that will, uh, I don't think machine learning will ever solve that problem. Uh, that's, that's, a flip of, that's the flip side of the coin. I mean, uh, uh, great papers, they get rejected for, by, by narrow-minded reviewers and the greatness yeah. only emerges later on, perhaps. Right. Plus the, so I finally found a, 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 a good referee for the guy, but, but he worked for a journal that, you know, that, 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 that screws the universities by charging too much for its journals. And so he didn't want to publish in that journal. Uh, so he left it on the archive for the moment. But, but uh, uh, you know, there's, the, the, I mean, uh, you know, I, I, as a journal, as the editor of the Journal of Algorithms, uh, I, I researched what was being done by the, uh, uh, the, the patients' publishers, who were, uh, who were in most cases uh, using our services for free to do all the refereeing and, and editorial work, and then, uh, you know, but, but they had no interest in anything but the bottom line, and they were making, you know, they, they were making a huge profit mar margins. They, they, the academic press had been bought out by somebody who had been bought out by somebody else who'd been bought out by Elsevier and so, and so on. And, and finally, the, uh, uh, the, the publishers were making arrangements with universities uh, uh, and swearing the university to secret, secrecy that, so that, that we couldn't even find out what un libraries were being forced to pay for the journal. And that was the last straw for uh, that was the last straw for me. And I, I reported all these things to our editorial board of the Journal of Algorithms, and and we resigned 100 percent, and we, you know, and, and we started the ACM transactions on algorithm. Uh, and so oh, is that yeah is that uh, is that um, the solution then more uh, support from professional societies, nonprofit yeah. organizations? It, it, yeah, it seems to me that, that we own, I mean, the professional side is, is us. We have some control over that. It, uh, I don't know what, what your opinion is. Uh, uh, I concur. I concur. Um, let me just Tim Gowers has change. A, you know, I'm going to change the subject. Oh, no, sorry, okay. go ahead. I'm going to change the subject a little bit. Uh, not only are you a serious computer scientist, but you're a serious organ player and composer. Can you tell us a little bit about what you've done and what you're up to in this domain? Okay, so anyway, you were, you were at my 80th birthday party as one of the, one of the great friends who came there. Um, and had I been in a t-shirt, it would have been that one, but I didn't uh, wear yeah. it. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, so I'm 82 now, but uh, on my 80th birthday, we had a, a, a celebration up in Northern Sweden where, where there's a particularly wonderful pipe organ. And uh, when I heard about that organ, I figured that that was, I had also planned uh, uh, since the 60s, to, uh, I, I wanted to write some kind of a major composition for, for pipe organ. Um, and and it was a it was a dream that I had all these years um, until finally I, I got to be I don't know 70, 70 some years seventy five years old and I said if I'm ever going to do this I better I, I better start now so I went uh, I, I was visiting Vienna and I went to the best music store in Vienna and and bought uh, some some blank music paper from the same store that Beethoven had 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 bought stock paper and Brahms and so on had bought from and I figured that wouldn't hurt and so I bought that with me and I started writing my piece 
And I worked off and on uh, for five years and came up with with, with a, a, a very strange piece that, I, but I have to say, I uh, I do like. I'm I am glad that it came out the way the way it did. So we had this this glorious uh, uh, we had this glorious premiere, and you can you can see it on YouTube. Google sent a team of of people to capture it. Uh, uh, they they have the best uh, the state of the art uh, several dozen cameras you know uh, so we so we have 360 degree uh, uh, with, with two different cameras and 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 lots of audio uh, uh, the, you know the best micing for for surround sound and, and, and so on and all this so we have many terabytes of data uh, for, from from that premier performance and uh, and I'm hoping that a computer scientist just for looking for a thesis project is going to make a beautiful virtual reality uh, uh, thing of this so that the, that people can be, can watch it and and, and select what, uh, as they're watching it to select uh, you know, what they want to see uh, because we got all the bits uh, uh, captured and, and and Stanford Archives has it, has it all in the digital form and, and, and it's available to any researcher who wants it. Uh, then I, I have yeah, go ahead. I have to say, watching it in person live was an overwhelming experience, and it would be good to relive. Yeah. So, it, so, so now uh, you know it, it's divided into twenty-two parts, each of which is about five minutes long, and you and, and you can watch one, uh, one part at a time. There's a playlist. If, if you go to my website, if you find the playlist, it's on it's on YouTube. But then, but then since then. Uh, the, the Canadian premiere took place, and it was a wonderful performance in Waterloo. Uh, a, a little more than what? Uh, when was it? Two years ago now. Um, and and uh, and the people there made a made a great video uh, where you can watch watch it in, you know edit in a, in a different way. And uh, and then uh, last year last year in 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 in, in the Czech. In Czechia in Brno, uh, uh, we had the third performance, and and, and again they have made a, a tremendous video of the of the performance. So so that now there are three uh, uh, excellent sources. So if, if anybody you know wants to see if they if if they like, I call it high bandwidth music because uh, 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 because I, I I was reacting to the a lot of the modern music. Uh, uh, Oh, I don't know. They, they they start out with some idea and then they hold it until the audience gets it, and then they move on to the next idea and, and, and so on. But uh, but but uh, but I, I wanted to go back to the way Mozart would do it and, and come up with ideas faster than than we can take in. So we have to listen to it twice and then the third th three times, and we get more each time. And and uh, uh, so so they made these really nice. Uh, they they've captured uh, in, in three beautiful ways, and I'm. I, and I'm, you know, I'm so delighted that that's out there in the uh, in in the music of the world, and maybe it'll be uh, uh, popular, maybe it'll it'll be a dud, but uh, uh, but but uh, at, at least uh, it satisfied me that you know I had this as one of my life goals. It was it's hard to explain, but. It, it, if if you would have talked to me two years before I finished it. And 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 somebody would told me that I only had two years to live, and so I bet you know I had to choose between finishing that piece or finishing the other computer program. I, I I somehow would have chosen that piece, although uh, I should have chosen the other computer program because I have no right to right to uh, to do music. <clears throat> uh, I don't see why not. So let me ask you uh, for the young researcher's benefit: Do you have any? advice to people wanting to go into computer science as it is now? Um, do you have any advice for students or for mentors of students? Well, the, you know, yesterday when the, the, uh, the question was asked to Leslie Lamport um, and then to Tony Hoare, but, but uh, Lamport's answer was, was so wonderful, he, he said, writing, <laughs> I'll do the writing. 
and and uh, and I, I guess I, I'm monopolizing this too much away from here, but but of course uh, it's for me to tell you to you know, f finish this book you're working on because uh, because. Uh, <laughs> Uh, all my life, I found that that what I was doing was sort of a convex combination of, of mathematics and writing, uh, and but but writing was always very important, and and and, and, and keep keep trying it all. That's why I I write so many computer programs now. I still uh, I, uh, I, I I certainly have to agree with that. Write, 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 rewrite, but it's a hard challenge. Ideas are worthless if you cannot communicate them with other people. And the best way to do that still is to get them down in old fashioned paper, I would yeah. say. And, and the other thing that came through from that dialogue yesterday was, uh, I would say in a different way is, is that don't, don't, be, don't be too much influenced by trendy stuff. Uh, don't 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 write a paper because you have to write a paper or because you think that they are, uh, you have to impress uh, people about you know, about something that, that you aren't personally really interested in, but you but you're trying to make an impression. I, that, that's the worst reason to write a write write a paper. The, uh, uh, the model that I like to think of is is uh, uh, Euler, uh, whose papers were always very impressive, but because his attitude was he wanted to tell the people what was impressing him. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I think Alan Kay, uh, who also gave a talk uh, at this uh, forum, he had this notion of outlaw ideas getting squashed. But uh, yeah. uh, you have to follow your own path somehow. You have to figure out what your own path is and follow it. The best students I've had came in with or ended up with their own idea that they developed. Uh, and actually, um, Pat Hanrahan earlier in the week said, I never give my PhD students a thesis topic. I require them to find a topic for themselves. Now that's kind of a rigorous approach, but uh, uh, that's part of what it is to do a PhD is to learn how to ask the right questions. It's much more about the right questions than the answers to other people's questions. Here, 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 and and in fact, asking questions is is something that you've just demonstrated that you know how to do well. And, and <laughs> well, let me ask one more. We are almost out of out of time here, but I noticed that um, according to Wikipedia, and this is a question from uh, one of the young researchers, you're known for your scientific jokes. I wonder if you can <laughs> tell us one of your favorites. Okay. Well, let me. Okay. So I. Take a look at Concrete Mathematics Bibliography, reference number 44. T. Brown, infinite multivariable subpolynormal waffles which do not satisfy the lower regular Q property, parent piffles, in a collection of 250 papers on waffle theory dedicated to R.S. Green on his 23rd birthday. Cited in such and such, okay, and then I have a, a marginal note. Uh, in the margin it always says, where was this publication cited in the margin it says such papers are not cited in this book and that's why, <laughs> that's why I wrote concrete mathematics and you look in the index and see who T. T. Brown was and he was trivial brown and uh, so it's, it's fun to look that that passage up in the different translations of concrete mathematics. <clears throat> I, I seem to recall also that your first publication was in an unusual magazine can you remind us of that one? Just a sec. <clears throat> Okay, so someday see if you can get, get a hold of this book, Selected Papers on Fun and Games. It not only talks about basketball, but it talks about my article, my first publication, which is uh, which was in Mad Magazine. Where I am in Mad Magazine. Okay, so. So if you want to be Don Knuth, young researchers, find a way to get your first article published in Mad Magazine, perhaps. So many questions, so little time. Let me thank you, Don, for a wonderful dialogue, and I'm thrilled to have participated in it. And uh, thanks to HLF and all the organizers. Okay, I guess we ought to cut, so bye-bye.
Thank you bye both bye, everybody. very much for the insight. And I'm sure your discussion was very inspirational for the young researcher. We really appreciate you both taking the time. Take care and thank you very much. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Peter. We appreciate everyone who tuned in to the virtual HLF. We hope that the session sparked some interesting discussions, which are free to continue in the Invent app and the virtual meeting hub. We look forward to welcoming you for day three and from all of us here at the Heidelberg Laureate Forum Foundation, take care and see you tomorrow.